Hello, my friends, and welcome back to Alien Protocols. You know, your unverifiable targets should only be interpreted as accurate as the average of your verifiable targets. So, I am considered to be one of the better, more accurate RV practitioners. I did like the two hour session with 20 targets. All of the 20 targets were accurate and then 15 targets in 15 days. All of those accurate. The least accurate was one that was like 60-70%. Um, and then three with Lance Munguia and uh, Eric Bard. All those were accurate. I even named the target. Three with Kickadoo named the targets. Um, uh, Omar named that was just one of the most detailed amazing ones too that was naming the target as well um, and the level of detail and accuracy in that one was ridiculous and I've had quite a few since um, and I haven't had any major failures so that doesn't mean with unverifiable targets I'm 100% accurate I've had failures in the past and I know I will have one <clears throat> soon um, it's just how it happens. Um, I've had a few in the past. One of my most embarrassing was for Grant Cameron. He did one for a group of everybody. And I think he said that he had actually changed the target and no one had gotten the target right. And I had, uh, it doesn't matter, but I had drawn one of the things, but it wasn't his final choice. But, uh, what other target did I get wrong? Oh, I did a radio show. Um... I'm forgetting which one it was, and I did a RV on air, and it wasn't, you know, accurate. So those are my two big inaccurate ones. And, uh, but that still doesn't mean that I'm 100% accurate on unverifiable targets. I think with unverifiable targets, even if you're 80, 90% accurate, you're probably 70, 60% accurate with unverifiable targets. So just to keep that in mind, I would like to do something that a kid named Raul requested, something I've done a little bit of in the past and done for myself out of fun, and it is life forms in the universe. Let's take a little trip, shall we, gang? Okay, first of all, it's important to realize that there is life just floating out in space. Just out in space, because there are ice worlds, like, um, I, which one is it here that we're near? It's not Titan. There's a couple of them that actually spray these ice worlds that spray out water tremendous distances into space. Huge, gigantic geysers. And obviously those would have algaes and other life forms. So in space we're going to find algae that can be reconstituted, brought back to life. Different types of algaes, eukaea, the most basic forms of life. Um, Ikea, not Ikea, you, you care, you're, you're whatever they're called. Um, then there'll be stasis creatures like uh, the tardigrade type who can dry themselves up, curl up in a ball, and survive the conditions of space. I'm not sure why a tardigrade would need to be able to survive the conditions of space, but it's one of the few that can meet all of those conditions from the radiation to the temperature to... Uh, the lack of oxygen, all the different things. So open space has life. It has dead creatures as well, of course, but it has life. And there's a lot of uh, panspermia, as it's called. Even cellspermia, a planet can <clears throat> have a meteor strike and the life can go up into space and come back down again to the same planet later, even. So... There's lots of different ways to get this life into space itself. But wanted to check out some more larger things. So in Cygnus the Swan, there's a super Earth. It is the third planet from the sun. It is a super Earth. It's rich, full of life on the land and in the sea. It's the third from the sun, and the sun is like one and a half of our suns. But the Earth is a super Earth. <coughs> And because of that, it has very peculiar, interesting creatures. It has this long 
very stubby, close to the ground, very powerful, boned, kind of caterpillar type thing. And it has an exoskeleton, and it's instead of using its force up and down against gravity, it swivels side to side and uses less um, energy because it uh, swivels instead of walks lifting legs and things like that. So um, it's an interesting way to deal with the heavy gravity effects of this particular world. Also, the belly of this creature has a lighter than air gas. So there's a gas in each one of these little spheres on the belly portion that make it a little lighter as well. And that's also the case with this gas bird. It kind of has very light, thin butterfly wings with kind of like bat type poles here at the top, you can see. Um, and that is an exoskeleton as well too. And the bird itself, the inside of the bird is filled with a lot of this, this gas. It's almost like a jellyfish with wings. So, um, and that helps it float a lot. There's also a pollen eater, which is a really interesting tall creature that has a very strong exoskeleton, these long strides, kind of like a super giraffe. And it feeds on giant flowers and other plants and it has a telescoping mouth that kind of comes in and out, uh, as opposed to like an elephant that uh, swivels around. So that is this uh, super earth right near Cygnus the Swan, right in a Cygnus the Swan constellation. And it's gonna be right near the heart of Cygnus the Swan. <clears throat> Next is inside Orion's sword in the constellation of Orion, near the top star, there is a red giant. And this red giant uh, has a super Jupiter. And by the super Jupiter, there is an ice moon. And it is filled with not just the standard uh, creatures that have bioluminescence. We have creatures in our solar system and some of our moons that have bioluminescence. And because of the tidal effects, the gravity effects of the big super planet that they're going around, like here on Earth with Saturn and Jupiter, because of the tidal effects, these icy moons flex. And they flex in the center of the planet where the mass is. And they have rift zones that create energy. And that's where the life can prosper from. So aside from the typical you know, bioluminescent diversity that are found on many of these ice moons around the universe, um, this one has some giant creatures, which is what made it interesting. Um, it has this giant sea cucumber type whale creature that can go great distances up and down in the water column and it can compress. It shrinks, literally. And because of the weight of the water, as it goes deeper, this kind of sea cucumber type whale thing can compress from 50, it can shrink 50% of its size from 100 feet long to 50 feet long. And um, these luminescent things that run down the side of it are a